Welcome everybody. Good morning, afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. My name is Marta ekelberg Jankowska, and I am the International Contacts Coordinator for the Fudge Foundation, the Foundation for the Preservation of Jewish Heritage in Poland. Um, I can see that we still have people joining us, so I would give us another couple of minutes to let everybody join. Okay, hey, I think we are ready. Um, I would like to welcome you all once again um, to our presentation, our first web webinar as uh, our foundations, the Foundation for the Preservation of Jewish Heritage in Poland. Um, I would like you tell you, to tell you what our mission as the foundation is, uh, to protect and commemorate the surviving sites and monuments of Jewish cultural heritage in Poland. Um, and this, this very project, uh, which we are very glad to present to you today, uh, is part of that mission. So uh, the project is named Virtual Connections to Material Jewish Heritage in uh, Poland. And uh, it consists both of a website and a series of webinars of which this uh, is the very first one. Um, this uh, project is a public task financed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Poland within the competition public uh, grand competition public diplomacy 2021. Uh, in addition to locations were made accessible with the help and support of um, the, the Jewish Heritage Foundation Foundation of Jewish Heritage and uh, the company Scanovania, which prepared those uh, virtual uh, digital uh, sites for everybody's view. Um, today's webinar on synagogues, we'll, we'll be talking about synagogues, which are the most important part of this project. You will see them featured on the website. Um, this this uh, webinar it will tell you about them as historical traces, uh, the history of the buildings and the communities and what we can learn from these buildings about the communities that, create, that created them and worshiped in them or perhaps um, lived in, in the vicinity and uh, rejected as well. So uh, this is uh, the first webinar. There will be another two. Um, the second will be um, dedicated to uh, the potential educational and uh, also cultural of these places. And we will be speaking about that on no November 22nd, so we're already inviting you. You can find the link uh, in our, uh, in our, uh, on our website. Um, and the third will be dealing with the issues of preservations and challenges um, of uh, preserving these, uh, these sites. So we will share that and hope uh, to receive some of your feedback and ideas about possibilities. Um, without further ado, I would like to um, welcome our distinguished guests. Today we will be um, holding a discussion with two um, amazing professors, Professor Thomas Hupka, who is currently in Oregon, and Professor Marcin Wojcicki in Wrocław today. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, I would like to briefly, um, because there's just so much to be said about each of, uh, of our panelists, but I will briefly introduce them. Professor Hupka uh, is a professor emeritus from the Department of Architecture, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Through almost 40 years of scholarship and teaching, he has attempted to link the practice and teaching of architecture to historical and cultural context. He has published widely on topics of popular vernacular architecture, including theoretical works and detailed studies of common buildings, such as New England farms, bungalows, ranch houses, and works, workers' cottages. He's the author of Respendlet Synagogue, which we will mention today as well, 
architecture and worship in an 18th century Polish community, which received awards, a very famous work. Uh, he was also a um, consult consultant um, on, uh, for the Pauline Museum for the reconstruction of the Gwoździec synagogue's roof and the film Raise the Roof, right? Um, we are very happy. So Professor has visited Poland and uh, quite often, if I recall. So uh, thank you, Professor, for being with us today. And uh, Professor, <laughs> Professor Marcin Wodziński, who works at the University of Wrocław in Poland, where he runs the Taubi Department of Jewish Studies and holds position of Professor of Jewish History and Literature. Uh, his research focuses on the history and culture of East European Jews in modern times, especially the Haskalah and the Hasidim. Uh, of his recent publications, he is most proud of Historical Atlas of Hasidim and Hasidim Quick Questions. Thank you. Um, welcome to you as well. Um, we are very, very happy to, um, to have this conversation today. And the first um, question I would like to to uh, present to you while I'll be showing also the sites and uh, while you will be talking and hopefully take some tours in the meantime as well is what can we what can we learn from these buildings when who build them what who uh, uh, who are the people that created them and um, from the design when we look at the design of these places at uh, the art, um, their architecture. Is there something that we can uncover just from this? Perhaps Professor Hupka could start. Um, uh, big question um, uh, for the audience. I look at uh, wooden synagogues, um, uh, a, a subset of total synagogues. There's masonry for the big towns, usually wooden for the small towns. So for the small towns, um, uh, it's the wooden synagogues built as early as the uh, uh, Jews come to Poland of 13th, 14th, 15th century uh, until the destruction. Um, uh, to, to, to a couple aspects of that. Um, as far as we know, these buildings are designed and constructed by uh, Poles or uh, Ukrainians or whoever they're living with uh, uh, at the time. And the, Jewish con and, the, and the Jewish congregation is not um, uh, the builders uh, of, of these uh, synagogues. So that's surprising to Jewish uh, in scholarship in, in, in some ways. Uh, uh, you then have to account for their uniqueness. And, and we'll maybe talk about that a little bit more, but um, how, did, how did this unique form of architecture uh, uh, develop? So three, 400, 500 years of continuous living in uh, of Polish towns uh, and a continuous development of, of the synagogues in these towns uh, by uh, Christian, Polish, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, builders, uh, uh, knowledgeable builders in, in support of these Jewish communities. Much more to say, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I will show, uh, first of all, introduce the book that you authored, Resplendent Synagogue, where um, our, our participants can, can find even more um, information. And the source you've mentioned to us before also of uh, Marian Kazimierz Piechotka, which are the gates of heaven. And I would move maybe quickly just to take a look uh, at Gwoździec Synagogue that you described in your book. Um, the, um, the outside of the synagogue. And if you could maybe tell us a few things, as you said, the builders were the same for, um, for all structures, so. Um, for a Polish audience, if you're looking at this building, you should be say this is unique uh, in some ways, and, and it was, um, but if you're knowledgeable about uh, wooden architecture uh, in Polish lands, um, these were close to, to some of the churches uh, uh, that you may know in the small villages too, but always unique, different. Um, and, and interestingly, they were recognizably different. They were, it's Jewish architecture. Um, and that's a surprising thing. If you look at Jewish communities throughout the world in similar periods, they usually build like uh, the Iranian uh, structures, uh, the, uh, the villages that they're building in. Here in Poland, 
for long periods, they develop a unique kind of Polish Jewish architecture. So it's, uh, it's very hard to describe. We don't have words for that. Um, your great historian, Miłobinski, uh, always told me um, uh, that, that these were um, probably designed by great Polish designers uh, uh, of the period or are local, locals in some ways. Um, a metaphor to look for on the outside, it's Polish and Jewish, and on the inside, it's Jewish. So there's a kind of inside outside uh, type of way of thinking about it uh, aesthetically or uh, functionally uh, in some ways. If I may j jump in, in relation to the website that, that we gather here to celebrate, it's important to notice there are no more wooden synagogues preserved in Poland, right? So we are talking about something that cannot be represented, unlike in Lithuania, where we have several wooden, smaller wooden synagogues preserved. And uh, what, we, what, what is left in Poland of the wooden synagogues are only elements of the Masonry structures like uh, uh, the antechamber or porticos that are built, the wooden structures adjusted to the Masonry synagogues, like in <clears throat> Bobova, for example. So you have wooden elements, but not wooden synagogues as such. So we cannot witness what Tom is presenting in Gwoździec, in his study of Gwoździec, what you can see partly reconstructed at the Polin Museum, you cannot see in real life. And that's the major difference between what you are documenting on your website and what has been, actually there is a small structure in, 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 in a village of, of uh, Wisznica, if I remember correctly, it's not very far from Tarnów. Uh, in a village there is a wooden hut that in the interwar period was turned into temporary synagogue for the small Jewish community there and has been preserved. The, the point is, it is a wooden synagogue, but it wasn't built as the wooden synagogue. So it doesn't have these very unique features that, 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 that Tom was talking about. In this sense, we have two different words. We have the word of the wooden synagogues, which is totally destroyed. And we have partly preserved masonry synagogues. And if we talk about them, the heritage that we can take care of and present to the further generation, it's mostly about the masonry synagogues. And the difference is not only between small town and big town synagogues. This is one of the distinctions, but what you are presenting on your website is, for example, um, Przysucha. Przysucha is a very small town with huge, huge masonry synagogue. So let me perhaps move to the website. Let's uh, take a break from Gwajic. We'll, we'll try to come back. And uh, I will- Can I add just one, one thing about that yes. picture? Can you go back? Oh yeah, um, of course, I can go back. Just so a sec. Uh, this is the, the Gavorzhev synagogue. It's made entirely of wood. The reason we can study these is that courageous Polish architectural students uh, uh, later, um, they documented th this architecture uh, to a magnificent degree. We would not have a, an ounce of, of ways of speculating about them. So um, Seisman Zajczyk at, at Krakow and, and others throughout, throughout Poland uh, during the interwar years especially uh, documented these to a great extent. Much was destroyed about the documentation, but much, what we know about them essentially is the survival of Polish architectural students. I mean, people like me in that, that era who went out and documented these structures. And, and that's um, uh, to have that saved is the only way that we know about what we're talking about today. The masonry synagogues survived only because of their bulk, essentially. Um, many were destroyed too, but the wooden ones were completely destroyed, except for, um, uh, uh, um, as we just heard, uh, a, a few in Lithuania, and, and um, I would call them minor synagogues uh, built during the 19th and 20th century. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. One more, one more wooden synagogue in Poland. It's now in Lesko. You know, that's mm -hmm. interesting because it's full, totally reconstructed. Really? Uh, yeah. It's uh, it's in the in the open air museum in Skansen in Lesko. There is a reconstruction of, of Pawanit Synagogue. It's another piece to see, but well, the problem is of authenticity. It's obviously uh, appearing there. Unlike most of the buildings in the open air museum there in Sanok, which are taken from their original locations and relo relocated into Sanok Museum, this one is fully reconstructed. Yes. So again, it, it's, it's very specific, very different status of this building. 
Thank you. Thank you. This is important to know. We're starting with the synagogues that could not be included in our digitalization because they do not exist, but we want to also mention them as an important part of heritage. And now I, I will go back to the site and uh, introduce the site. Okay. Here we are. You can uh, access, as you can see, the address is over here. We invite you to access the uh, site also on your own. And um, as you see the project within it, we have uh, digitalized eight, uh, actually six locations. There's eight because there's another two that we've added. Um, one was created before the project, one in the same time, but um, with the help of Jewish Heritage Foundation. And, um, and you can see uh, they're mostly in the East um, as these are mostly under our, this is the region that we mostly take care of. And also these are the really prominent sites. Um, and we will also discuss this region a little bit in depth with Professor Virgin soon. We've mentioned Przesucha, um, we have also wine suit and we'll, uh, I would love to show it to you in a minute as it is very beautifully decorated. Um, it is important to note also that if you start looking through the websites and go into the tours, you will notice that they also come from different traditions and we can compare, take a quick look at wine suit and for example, Alston, and you will see one uh, synagogue that was created by a very traditional community in the Baroque style also. And the other that was created much later and it reflects it's not a synagogue sorry it's a pre-funeral house in Olsten uh, but it's also a community structure and it reflects much more the Haskalah the reform movement a different kind of attitude towards Judaism so that's also a part of learning about these communities as they had different uh, stances. Uh, let's go to wine soup maybe for a minute just to show you this beautiful site. Mm -hmm. This is no doubt one of the most beautiful synagogues in Poland. And it's mm -hmm. great that it has been documented. Uh, both the structure and also the paintings inside, they are just amazing. Yes. So I hope you both, uh, you two professors will shed more light on the decorations here as well. Takes a minute to load. I believe that when, when it's loading, it might be a good time to tell because it's not only that we look into what's inside, but it's even more general. If you look on the synagogue in the structure of the small town of Weinsut, you understand this is one of the places that is under the control of the prince of the castle. There is a castle of Weinsut and just outside of this, in between the castle and the market square, there is the synagogue. So it presents the position of Jews within the community, the wider community of the town uh, in uh, what in Galicia, in uh, in Eastern Poland. Uh, so this is, if you look uh, in a kind of urbanistic sense on where the synagogue is located and what's its place in relation to other places in town. And then you come to, to see what is decoration inside, which is actually amazing. The synagogue is 18th century, if I remember, but most of the paintings, they uh, much of them are actually dated and they're from the 19th century. Uh, there is also Kahal room, a bedina room, which is outside of the main hall, which is also decorated, also called Heuser room, the place at which the seer of Lublin, the famous uh, Hasidic leader, was praying, and this is the 20th century decoration, much later. So obviously, it is not from the time of um, uh, of the Seer of Lublin, but all together, it creates uh, quite an amazing space. Yes, I believe this is the room. That's right. That's right. Maybe this is a good uh, since we are in this room. Before we'll go back to the decorations, but I'm. Um, I just realized that it would be interesting to say about something about the relationship of this room and the community synagogue like this one uh, with the Hasidic movement as there is, it's, it's been said that this is the room where, um, where mm. Jose, the seer of Lublin used to pray. Actually, and, what we can read here, it is that it was done in uh, 1912, mm. as the inscription says, thanks to Gabai uh, Yuda, son of uh, Naftali. And what you see here are four animals. This is direct quotation from Pirke Avot, 
saying be like uh, fast like the deer and uh, light as uh, as uh, uh, an eagle and strong as uh, um, uh, and strong as, as a lion to fulfill the commandments of your father who is in heaven right so it's it's the, possibly the most typical ex um, decoration that you can imagine in a synagogue uh, but what is interesting is the relation between what we have the, as the seer of Lublin space and the main hall, because it expresses tension between the Hasidism, a very much powerful socio-religious movement of this area, and the synagogues. Synagogues were not the places of choice for the, for the Hasidim to pray. They would pray rather in small rooms, either in separate stible or cloison, small, small prayer houses, or if it was within the synagogue, it was a, a room, the base din room, the kahal room, the spaces that were not the main hall. To separate between what was the main space in Nusach Ashkenaz, in regular prayer rite of the dominant Jewish community, and in different uh, uh, Nusach Sfart that were uh, employed by the, uh, by the Hasidim. So, so Again, here, if you look on the space between those two places, the big and small, you have the tension within the Jewish community that you can trace. Yes. Uh, in, in terms of their uh, decoration or the uh, the prayers they put on the wall, um, the Hasidim never um, remodeled the major spaces that they um, absorbed in their in their communities. So, um, some religious groups, when they change, they tear down all the decoration, et cetera. The Hasidim never did that. And, and you just explained how they, they primarily prayed in smaller spaces. Um, just for some of you thinking about, uh, here we have a Weinsutz major space. Uh, we call it a, a central bima, uh, those four columns in the center. And then the, 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 the community space uh, uh, surrounds it. And in addition to that, where those little windows are around all the way around are small rooms of various kinds, the kahal, the, the women always have a gallery, sometimes on the first floor, sometimes on the second. So that's always there to think about. And, and that, that particularly changes over time with the Hasidim or, with, or even in short periods. Um, so you, you might think of a kind of big box with the, with the bima and the ark in the center, and then around it or just an amazing Group of community spaces, some, mm -hmm. sometimes all secular kinds of spaces also, but, but religious uh, spaces as uh, uh, home of the rabbi, uh, sometimes they even connected to the, uh, to the building itself. So that's always a good uh, research project for any of you uh, that have a synagogue in town about uh, mapping that out about, and they'll tell you about how uh, Judaism uh, adjusted to the modern world in some ways. And um, it's surprising in a space like that, you expect a heater. <laughs> uh, as we no, say, they dominate the cold. It's kalte, I mean, it's in America always ask me, Yo, yeah. well, where's the, where, where's the furnace? <laughs> uh -huh. Tom, <laughs> this is kalte uh, 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 Once in a while, in, in some of the rooms that surround it, they'll have a 20th century uh, uh, stove or something like that. But uh -huh. that's almost always post uh, uh, 1900 or, or, or something like that. So if you can imagine worshiping cold, this occurs to, uh, in the Christian congregations mm -hmm. too. Uh, uh, we're praying cold uh, in, in their long Polish winter. Remember uh, that? Actually, I think they didn't pray here. It was called Kalte Schul, but it's very often, as you say, there are rooms on the side that have the heater, they have the stove, and they are on the, for the winter time, they are moving to small places. And this is kept only for rare communal gatherings and as you were saying i think this is beautiful that the synagogue provides you the spatial representation of what the community is both its function and its structure and i'm doing this ex ex exercise with my students quite often going to pinchuf which is not on your list because it belongs to the museum the local museum in pinchuf but this is the synagogue that i possibly know the best because we documented it together with andrei chinsky and this is Traditional synagogue of the uh, the Pinchuf synagogue is traditional so-called uh, uh, fortress synagogue, fortress style synagogue. Mm -hmm. And within this building, which was built at the turn of the 16th, 17th century, you have within one space, you have four major rooms. You have so-called Kalteschul, the cold place, which is the main hall, 
the main the the the, the main place the main place but this is kept only for the main gatherings it is not used for everyday prayers just on the side of this you have small room which is bet hamidrash the place for studying but also place for praying and there you have an oven you have the heater that allows you to stay there and pray or just socialize between uh, 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 Mincha and Marif, you are meeting other people to read from, I don't know, Enyankev, to read Mishnayot, to discuss in your Hevres, to, to, to uh, meet other people. But this is also a place where people traveling to the side, to the place, are gathering. So this is the uh, night, shel night shelter for travelers. Being on up to three days, you could stay in a Jewish community, which was tradition. And actually, you see everything of this expressed on the walls of this uh, of this uh, uh, Bet Hamidrash, because those people spending long winter nights here. Exactly, this is the place on the right. You have the the, the paintings, the frescoes from the Bet Hamidrash. But even more than what you have officially painted up there. Those people spending long winter nights there sleeping, they were bored, they couldn't sleep for 14 hours. So what they what did they do? They put their names on walls. You know the custom. And we have hundreds and hundreds of graffitis that were put into Pinchuf, carved into the, the plaster on wall with first names of people who are spending time there. So you have another aspect of what synagogue really was. It was the place for people to stay overnight. If you if you pass the Bet Hamid, the, the Bet Hamid Rash, which is just the side room for the main hall, you enter Kahal room and you have the paintings here on the left. You cannot see it very clearly as it is now. You need to stretch your imagination but try to imagine this is a sm relatively small place the kahal room and also beddin room the place where all the rabbis are gathering to judge formally in name of the jewish community and this is all painted white with strong red paint at which you have quotations from torah about the way you are supposed to judge and try to imagine this space, white, red letterings, and the meeting of the judges and the size meeting. Therefore, it is also showing on the on the walls and in the space what is the function of this community. Community is not, as we imagine it today, a voluntary community of the faithful. This is pre-modern structure that is obligatory for any Jew living within this town and adjacent villages, right? So community has power, it has the power to judge and it has the its own law to judge it by those by those standards. And everything of this is expressed within the space. This is also extremely interesting because these Pinchu paintings, they date from 1608, 1609. So they are the oldest preserved wall paintings in, in Polish synagogues. Just above, Bet Hamidrash and Bet Be 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 Bezdin on the second floor, for American standard, I say second floor, uh, there is a, a woman room, Ezrat uh, Nashim, Babinet in Polish. And this is another unique space. First of all, it shows you separation between men and women. But even more than this, this is the sole example of the wall paintings from the synagogal wall paintings that are in Yiddish. So you have also cultural distinction in all of the spaces for men, for, for judgment, for Bet Midrash, you have everything in Hebrew because that's the language of Jewish religion. That's the, the official language of Judaism. In women's section, you have the painting, you have the prayer and the prayer is in Yiddish. So it's, it's, it's another in a very, vivid expression of the this the division within the within the Jewish community uh, in Pinchuf. You have the same expression uh, in in Weinstuf, as, as Tom was pointing. You have the same in uh, in uh, uh, Weinstuf, for example. Maybe it's not so prominent as in Pinchuf, but essentially this is the main hall. You have the kahal room. You have adjacent places. You have place for women, which is separated but together. So also it's important. It's not outside. It's not in another part of the city. This is just 
adjacent to the main hall of the of the building. It's the same here, obviously. You have the, the if, if you look into the windows on the left, obviously you have the prayer room, you have you, you have Ezrat Nashim located there, the, the, here in Krasnik. Krasnik, yes. We are in Krasnik now, which also has the main uh, synagogue room as well as the Bet Midrash, which was um, a place where uh, people could also stay overnight, sleep. Mm -hmm. And I'm just interestingly in Orla, you have the same structure. You have the main building of the synagogue, and then you had a uh, Bet Midrash just on the side. Mm. Uh, and there in Orla, the most interesting of all the inscriptions that you have, and it's again unique inscription I, I, I found on the site of the synagogue. Mm. There is a stone carved inscription put on the wall do not pee on the walls of the synagogue. Uh, I, I, I haven't seen anything of this uh, type anywhere else in the world, actually. It's Orla. You have it documented, too. Yes, I will show it now. Um, let me just... Okay. Just hide. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> in the wooden synagogues, uh, we don't have the tradition, or it has not survived within the minor rooms uh, surrounding the prayer hall of, of um, uh, scriptural um, uh, quotes and um, imagery or, or, or decoration. We primarily, uh, what we know about the prayer hall comes from the prayer hall the, of, the, of the decorative uh, uh, motifs. Um, you mentioned um, uh, Yiddish prayer by women and uh, in the people have done the research um or we do have prayer books uh written in yiddish for uh for the females uh in in their in their smaller uh, areas uh situated off the synagogues but we don't have any i don't think uh, uh remnants of uh, any uh on the any decor decorative motifs uh associated with women's prayer or whatever uh in the women's galleries uh, that have survived in the wooden synagogues that, that i am aware of This expression of what was of interest for those who documented those synagogues in the early 20th century, right? Because much of those documentation came from either the First World War or immediately after that. And those are those were people who had obviously the masculine perception of the world of the world. What was important for them was the main hall. Mm -hmm. The most elaborate, obviously, the most beautiful. But they were not looking for, you know, elements that we are interested in, interested in today, the, the, the gender division and the spaces of those who are possibly not the, the, the dominant force in the community, but they're still existing and they have their own culture. Just, uh, <clears throat> taking a small walk around Orla. I'm not sure if we can see that um, writing that you've mentioned, Professor. It's Virginia. outside. It's outside. You need to leave their space, and it's just on the right side uh, of the of the entrance. Let's see if you can see that. Yeah, but I I would say you can see it uh, uh, on your own when you visit the site, or you can go to Orla. It's also great to be there. Mm -hmm. There is a very friendly mayor of, of the town uh, who is happy to give the guide the tour to the synagogue. So yes, we do encourage, though we do realize that right now, especially with the pandemic, it's more difficult. And part of the idea was to enable people, sorry, who cannot travel from afar to still visit the synagogues. But we are also hoping it's seeing them in virtual tours will uh, encourage you to visit them in person when, whenever that becomes possible. And, uh, in relation to this, if I, if I might add, uh, Marta, it's very, you mentioned it already, but I think that's a very important issue to highlight. This website is presenting eight synagogues of various origin with different styles and different traditions because we have the synagogues that uh, actually the, the, the pre burial place which is referring to totally different German tradition uh, 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 constructed by famous German Jewish architect, uh, Mendelssohn, 
one of the famous, the most famous modernist architects. But we have also traditions going back to the ideal town of Zamość, to the 16th century Sephardic synagogue. Because if, 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 if you look on Zamość, for example, that was constructed for the Sephardic community when Jan Zamoyski was establishing Zamość as an ideal town, he had an idea this would be a commercial center for east-west trade, stopping there with most important groups for early modern trade, meaning Greek district, Armenian district, and Jewish district. But he was uninterested in having Ashkenazi Jews settling there. He wanted to have Sephardi Jews with their business contacts in the Levantine Mediterranean areas and going farther east. And actually, at the very beginning, when, when it started to function in the 1580s, it was so. It was br uh, broken down in, at the beginning of the 17th century with, with uh, Valachian Moldavian Wars. It was just impossible to continue the trade and then importance of this community shrinked. The, the, the Sephardi community did not continue, but you have very different tradition. Also, it's interesting, Zamość is the place which uh, in Zamos you had two Jewish communities. You had the community within the city walls and another suburban community that was outside. Outside, it was kind of typical Polish Jewish community with a lot of Hasidic groups, a lot of very traditional Jews. While within the city walls, there was community that was very proud not to have a single Hasidic shtibol, not to have Hasidic communities inside. Well, it's difficult to say they were maskidic, they were Haskalah oriented, but obviously they were um, liberal and they were non-Hasidic. So if we look on, you cannot see elements of this within the decoration of the site because it was constructed in very different tradition. As Tom was saying, this is obviously non-Jewish architect commission when all of the city was built, right? But you, if you know the history of this of the space, you understand the tensions that are there. And this is in relation to the fact that uh, Zamosh synagogue is now the center of so-called Hasidic route uh, in uh, uh, that you can travel across Eastern Poland and you can visit variety of Hasidic places there, which is an, an, an ironic aspect of the story, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> indeed. Um... Yes, it is. And, but it's important to remember and remind the true story of the synagogue and its, uh, its tradition, its uh, more reformed tradition. Um, as we are mentioning the reform movement, I'd like to show Eric Mendelssohn's uh, pre-funeral house just very shortly. Um, just find, okay. Uh, as this is really famous uh, structure as well. And, uh, and uh, um, I want to take you there just one minute. I think this is the oldest preserved structure built by Mendelssohn, right? Yes, I believe so. He was himself born in Olsztyn, I believe, mm -hmm. even though he worked outside later. But it will show us very different uh, architecture, very different community from the ones we've seen so far. So this is 19th century, right? I believe oh, early, early 20th century, I believe, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, you are right. Um, I'm trying to find. Hmm. Okay, let's just move in then. Marta, I think it would be good if we have questions from the audience, because there are some people watching the presentation. It'd be very nice to have their comments or questions. I okay. saw some people putting their chats, so maybe there are. There is um, one question from Michael Trezon. Is it a myth that the Orler Synagogue is originally, uh, was originally a Calvinist church? Have, have, has anyone, um, any of you heard this story? Uh, uh, Calvin's pretty late. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're talking about, uh, what are his dates, uh, 18th century? Uh, anyway, we have Jews and synagogues preceding this by 500 years. So I don't know what Calvin 
uh, it wouldn't have very much uh, to do with uh, traditions of <laughs> synagogue no, I architecture. Don't, I, don't, I don't know the story. I have no clue whether it's true. Well, historically, it would be possible. It would be possible in a sense that we have a strong inroad of Calvinist movement in the territories of Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which are pushed back by Catholic uh, takeover later on. But I see no reason why it, it would be specifically Jewish community taking over the Calvinist uh, uh, church. No, I don't. I don't know the story, and, and I cannot confirm this. Sorry. Uh, the history of Protestant churches in uh, Poland is. is this is small and controversial because it was a really radical thing to uh, go against the Catholic Church uh, in Poland at that time. So uh, I, I haven't studied this, but and I have certainly don't know of monuments uh, that have been influential in, in any way. Uh, uh, but there probably are scholars who, who have studied this. So I should, you should ask them. And there's a follow-up question. Um, were all these ancient shuls, these historic synagogues, uh, used as, uh, as synagogues, as shuls during 20th century before the war, of course? Were there, was there, commun were there communities that practiced there? Uh, again, uh, uh, so were, were these synagogues used by communities before the war? Yes, yes, this, these are all communal synagogues, and it's very important to stress the distinction between prayer house and the communal synagogue. All those places, except for Olsztyn, which was uh, which was the pre-burial uh, uh, place. So it's not the communal synagogue as, 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 as such. All the other places were communal synagogues. The central places at which, as I was describing for Pinchuf, it is the same applies to all other places that we have on the list. The, the, the central, communal synagogue take under control of the Kahal, of the Jewish community. Together with this, there existed other smaller prayer rooms, either on the side of the building or in other rooms, either Hasidic or non-Hasidic. They didn't have to be just Hasidic, though Hasidism was possibly the most important factor in establishing the splinter groups that move outside of the, of the main uh, synagogue. But there were also other like uh, professional confraternities. So you had the prayer hall for um, tailors, or you could have a prayer hall for, um, uh, I don't know, blacksmiths, or, or, or any other profession that would establish separate prayer halls. In uh, 18th century, you have very significant uh, clash between those two tendencies. The Jewish community is trying to control it and not to allow most of those groups to establish their own prayer house because it is removing part of the power of the community from the Kahal. But towards the end of the 18th century, this is becoming predominant. Mm -hmm. And very significantly in the 19th century, the, the imperial regimes are actually encouraging the splintering groups because they believe that the power of Kahal is the power that is preserving the Jewish community from reforming into more civilized Jewish society. So the, 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 the splintering groups are actually uh, encouraged. But still, as I say, the, the main synagogue has been preserved. And this is the, the space that, that we see there. The say, this is true for Shisucha, this is true for Zamosh, this is true for Orla and other places, also Wainsut. But as, as we were saying in case of Weinzut, it's also important to say that the synagogue, especially in the late 18th and the 19th century, didn't have to be the central place for prayer within the community. We have kind of interesting stories when the Hasidic groups emerge in towns. Sometimes we have clashed. I, 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 I know several of those stories. Maybe the most picturesque is from Wask. We have a, a a wave of complaints from Kahal, from the Jewish community, to, to the state authorities that Hasidim stop praying at the main synagogue because they established their own prayer hall on the side, and they don't want to pay for the preservation and for the uh, upkeeping of the, of the main hall. So for this reason, the main building of the synagogue is falling apart. And they, uh, they ask the, the, the Polish government to force the Hasidim to return to the synagogue or at least if they don't want to pay to pray here, make them pay for it and, and allow them pray, praying outside. So 
there is a lot of of a, a variety of of, of um, forces within this uh, story uh, but again those are the communal synagogues uh, we need here uh, lots of very detailed case studies of particular synagogues in the small towns in the larger towns uh, to to get at you know there is the official documentation but then there is the uh, who, who did worship in those towns? And anyway, that, that would be a very good study of both what was said or what do Jewish scholars say about it today and the, the Hasidim of uh, Did that really happen that way? And, and what were the smaller uh, uh, synagogues that they prayed in? Anyway, it's a good geography lesson um, and, and, and it's a good lesson of Jewish administrative religious uh, um, uh, power. Uh, within the community and how they subdivide it. So good luck, you guys. Uh, and also <laughs> and the so story- It's a difficult yeah. subject and, and do not think it's an easy one to, uh, to filter out, especially because of the destruction. So it makes it so much harder. In the 1830s, a, 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 a journalist from the Jewish Chronicle from London was traveling through central Poland and describing what's happening at various synagogues. Among others, he came to Kozienice, the stronghold of Hasidism. There, in Kozienice, he reported an extremely interesting story. There is a huge synagogue, and it's empty. Not very far from the synagogue, there is a prayer hall within the, uh, the yard belonging to Magid of Kozienice, the local Hasidic leader, and it's full up to capabilities. You have every, nearly everybody praying there in the Hasidic, uh, in the Hasidic Shtibo, with exception of 10 old men that the Hasidic leader ordered them to pray within the main synagogue in Nusak Ashkenaz, in a non-Hasidic rite, for the benefit of women, because women were not allowed to pray in, in the Hasidic Shtibo. And they had to have their Ezrat Nashim, their women's space, somewhere. So for women to be able to watch and to participate in men praying in the main hall, the Hasidic leader delegated 10 old men to pray Nusach Ashkenaz there in the synagogue. So it shows how, um, how weak actually the position of the main communal synagogue could be in relation to the other splintering forces. I think that it, what, what is evident from what you both are saying is how diverse this, this society was and uh, how many different approaches there were and how much they were quarreling. There, it was not boring, certainly. Oh, no. going on. <laughs> I would also uh, want to introduce now the director of our foundation. I will allow him to enter as a panelist. So just give me a moment. Director Puchta should be able to join us now. Yes. I can see him. It's just happening right now. <laughs> He'll be here. So this is Director Puchta joining us um, from the office. Hello. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> uh, I would like, first of all, uh, to express my gratitude, my sincere gratitude, both. Uh, to Professor Hupka and to Professor Wojinski for accepting our invitation and uh, joining this uh, webinar with your extensive knowledge about the synagogues in Poland. And uh, not only the, uh, the history, but also all the functions that uh, they were really uh, playing in the society. I take also this opportunity to express my sincere thanks to Marta for not only organizing this seminar, but also preparing all the project. Uh, I believe that this is something that uh, is very important uh, from the point of view of uh, the possibilities of travel between uh, various towns in Poland and uh, not only Poland inside, but also with uh, our partner countries uh, in North America, in Europe, and also in Israel. So from my point of view, uh, I consider this uh, project as a starting point for further uh, 
presenting fervor synagogues uh, and uh, historical sites uh, in Poland to those uh, individuals uh, who come every year to Poland, uh, but also to those who cannot uh, come and visit our country. What is important also for me from uh, uh, what I saw uh, in the, in the uh, presentation today is uh, to show to all the participants various stages of preservations, or I would rather say deterioration of the synagogues. And my message uh, to all participants today is to allow us uh, as the foundation for Jewish, uh, for the preservation of Jewish heritage in Poland to join forces with you in order to bring life to those uh, sacral buildings uh, that uh, need preservation for future generations. So thank you again for letting me join the panelists. Uh, and uh, I uh, would like uh, now to give uh, uh, the voice to Marta. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, we still have a few minutes, so we encourage more questions. About uh, Among the questions that were already posed, I saw a question about women and uh, their, um, the languages they were using, the difference between uh, men and women in the sense that men were usually probably more familiar with Hebrew and women um, spoke Yiddish. What would you say about it? And, and were they, um, is it safe to assume that they spoke, not only spoke, but also read Yiddish? Uh, yeah, it, it has no re direct relation to the synagogue. Uh, it's just the issue of the everyday life. All the Jewish community, Ashkenazi Jewish community, spoke mm -hmm. Yiddish. So both men and women spoke Yiddish. Men were customarily taught Hebrew from early age of four, five, six. As we know from historical research, unlike a prominent stereotype, majority of Jews could not read Hebrew. In a sense, they could not read it and understand it. They were, they knew Hebrew to the level to be able to pray from the Hebrew uh, prayer book. They were able to understand the texts that were reappearing in their everyday religious life. They could read from, most of them could read from Torah, many of them could pray, but they were unable to read new Hebrew texts. So it is not so that all the men knew Hebrew. It was only the rabbinical elite, those who were able to spend enough time on learning Hebrew and on learning rabbinical literature to read Hebrew. So in this sense, the typical expression for those who read Yiddish literature was that the Yiddish literature is for women and men like women, which was obviously the derogative expression, right? Men like women, meaning those who cannot read real literature, the literature in Hebrew. Uh, so that was the, the concept of the hierarchy of languages. And it is important to remember also that you had the Yiddish literature and Yiddish communication that was considered just everyday. It was just vernacular of this community. Then you have Hebrew, and it was for the learned elite, several dozen uh, percent of the community. So it's not very small elite, but it was not universal. And on top of this, then you had those who were able to read Talmud, which is not in Hebrew, which is in Aramaic. So you had to learn another foreign language and to be able to do the exegesis of the foreign foreign language in another language, right? So you had three layers of Aramaic, Hebrew, and Yiddish. So, so it, it, just to put the matter short, Yiddish was the language for everybody. It was vernacular for them. But many men, men were supposed to know also Hebrew. And a, a section of them were able really to read in Hebrew. Majority of them were able to pray in Hebrew. So the places for men were decorated in Hebrew inscriptions, both inscriptions with uh, the prayers, which was the most typical text to put there in. Uh, yeah, thank you for saying the Talmud is in Hebrew, Mishnah is in Hebrew, and uh, and uh, uh, the other part is in Aramaic. So just to make matter clear, that's right. Somebody put it into the chat. Uh, I was over uh, simplifying. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, what what I was saying that uh, 
the women section was in Yiddish only because women were not supposed to know Hebrew, even though some of them did know, and we have historical examples, some of them very prominent of, of Jewish women who were learned in, in rabbinical literature and could read and write in Hebrew better than many men, but there were still exceptions than the rule. And then we had the, the, the male community that was supposed to know Hebrew. And you know, assumption is not the same as reality. Many of them were not really able to read this language properly. But still, assumption was that since they spent some time learning this, they would. So if you-, uh, if you And to that, you should, you should probably add that the uh, average uh, Jew uh, also knew uh, Polish uh, uh, and German. Um, and plus maybe a little Ukrainian on the side. Um, uh, yeah, he, he, sorry, he, he, he could speak average, it, speak it, like, but not to read it. That's, that's the difference again, because yeah, he yes. would not read but, but, Gelach. He wouldn't read the, the Latin characters, which yes, were associated but, 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 with, but on, with the church. On, on average, we, we should say that we have a community skilled in, in, in various languages we, and the equivalent of my grandparents and, and, and others uh, uh, of the general population would not have this command of language uh, for reading uh, in, in, by any standard um, as, as the Jewish community did, as you just described in the various levels of, of the Jewish community. So there is a, there's a language differential, differential and that comes to America. I understand it more in America. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I put the picture from, I believe it's from Gvozhet Synagogue, one of the wooden synagogues, where you can see, as you saw also in, the, in Weinzut and many masonry synagogues as well, the um, prayers are put on the walls. Perhaps, as, as you were talking, I, I thought also to help um, people to pray, uh, to read, to, to have these prayers accessible to read them for the walls, as uh, not everybody knew Hebrew perfectly. This was a sort of um, well, system. Well, 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 what you see there is a, um, a painting uh, by uh, 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 Kaufman. Kaufman. Um, Isidore, Isidore Kaufman. He said he's a Jewish painter, painter from Vienna, uh, 1900 to 1910 or, or so. Here he, he goes to these small Polish towns and he puts his painting, and that's why we can talk about the color of, of these uh, some of these synagogues which uh, which he re he recorded. There you see, I mean, um, there's some prayer. Uh, I've studied the prayer of, of this synagogue. The Jewish average Jewish congregation in Gavorzhets would have memorized these prayers. They didn't really need uh, scriptures on the wall. Uh, I, I've written and other people have written uh, about this too. So what we have is a, a visual liturgy, that uh, segments of a, uh, a liturgy that's on the wall. Uh, it's a good research project for any of the masonry synagogues uh, that we have, or uh, what are why did they choose these prayers uh, on the wall, and for what reason? There's some obvious ones, but it gets very difficult. Uh, because we have there's a unity uh, between town different towns and that that provides a way of thinking about uh, a, a liturgy on the wall and this needs study so you guys get out there and study it <laughs> if you can it's not only liturgy on the wall but you have also inscription who donated it who paid for this and who yeah, did it right there's always so another another level of information uh, the, the, the animals that you see, just as a general rule, I would uh, look for the Polish audiences and to say, you just did not have an equivalent of this kind of art emphasizing uh, a cornucopia of, of animals, but the Jews preserved this, this animal um, iconography. There you see, here's Gavorzhia's ceiling. We have unicorns and bears and, and, and the, the animals of the zodiac, etc. but and there's stories associated with that, but we do not have an equivalent of that in any other art form. And so what we have here is a unique Jewish art. <laughs> the way I look at it, I say, this is made by Jews, for Jews, and about Jews. And so it, it really differs from uh, equivalent art of the, of the churches, uh, Orthodox and, uh, and Catholic uh, of the folk churches of the period. Some parallels, but nothing, nothing equivalent to this. So. There's a real Jewish art form that uh, that is on the masonry synagogues. It is preserved. Um, it's a hybrid version that, that you see on the masonry synagogues that combines with classical details and others. I mean, it's very difficult to interpret. Anyway, good stuff. And it's also beautiful because uh, 
this is very close to the, to the folk art. It's uh, very close to what you can see on the Jewish tombstones, for example, is very much of the same iconography that you, you see in the synagogues. So you see that this is not kind of, as, as Tom you are saying, unlike in the churches, this is not only associated with the high art, with elite, somebody con coming from outside with very special high artistic competences and putting this art for the masses. You have people who come up from the place with very local traditions and they paint it the way that people around understand it. Well, it, that's true, but but the artists who painted these were well known and these were um, I, I, itinerant artists. So of, 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 you imported them. At Gavors, just they were imported from Yarchov, uh, 100 miles away. Mm -hmm. So we, we have here an art form that was not, it's not shtetl art. Uh, we should just not use a term like that. And that no, no, no. this was, a, a, um, although that you use the motifs in gravestone art and silverware, maybe, or something like that, the total composition is made by skillful artists, um, Jewish skillful artists, um, uh, uh, and, and the painting alone, I think, stands because we have the synagogue being done by Christian uh, or local uh, uh, folks and all that. So there's an interesting parallel there between uh, Jewish art and uh, uh, Jewish uh, art done for Jews uh, by Christian builders and things like that. Very okay. complex, very interesting. Thank you, professors. I'm trying. It's It's been a very um interesting and exciting and impossible for me to let you know that, that we've we've already run out of time so that says uh, that that represents how this discussion was interesting for everybody hopefully and uh, i want to thank you uh, very very much for being with us today um and yes i would love to uh see us continue uh even in the same uh, team as today because we i can see that we could talk and talk for another hour easily um for now we invite everybody to the next session on november 22nd and you will find all find all the information about that webinar on our website which we showed you today um thank you so much and uh see you soon thank you thank you it was great thank you. talking to you Th oh, Virginia. thank you for inviting Virginia. me bye bye thank you, sir goodbye everyone thank you thanks a lot